hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Praise the Lord, everybody. Aren't you glad you have the opportunity to lift up the name of the Lord together? This beats the best hospital room anywhere near here. Amen. God's been good to us. Thank God for health, for life, and most of all for the desire that he put in our spirit to be in his presence. He didn't have to do that. Amen. But he chose to draw us. He chose to put it in our heart. Amen. I'm telling you what, we're, we're blessed people. We really, really are. It's a delight to be in the house of God. It's so good to be back in the United States of America. <laughs> I love this nation. Amen. Thank God for his hand upon us. And uh, I'm sure people will say more, but what started out as a wonderful missions trip ended up as a wonderful missions trip with a whole lot more to talk about. Amen. But those of those of you that went with us, I know our lives were changed in the country of Peru. We had such a beautiful, powerful move of God in every service, and, and uh, the food was delicious. Let me just tell you, Peruvian food, there's, there's a reason that they were number one on the gastronomy for nine years in a row or something like that, but uh, I thank God that I'm back in, back home. Amen. And there's something about walking in this house, uh, just entering in this sanctuary and feeling what we feel so special. Thank God for the church. Thank God for his presence that makes a difference. I want us to pray together, and then I'll let you be seated because I want to read a lengthy reading uh, for this lesson today. I want you to pray, and let's just ask God to touch our minds, touch our hearts, uh, to give us understanding. Amen. God's got something, I believe, for every one of us. It may be just a little something that you might need from the Lord. Amen. Jesus, we are so aware of your presence. You bled and died for us. You're the reason that we're here. We're asking, Lord, that your touch would make the difference today, that you'll touch our minds, our hearts, our spirits. Give us understanding, I pray. Bless this people. Minister throughout our service, Jesus. Let there be lasting change in hearts, O oh God. Pour out your presence in a mighty way, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. God bless you. So good to see Brother Brennan Claiborne. Amen. In the house of God and Briar. Praise the Lord. I want to turn your attention to 2 Kings chapter 3 and just make a few comments here today out of this setting. 2 Kings chapter 3. Kind of a sad time in the history of Israel as a divided nation, the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And sadly, out of all of their kings, they could not produce one good king. And what was it? Nineteen kings? Not a good one among them. And the sad thing is, is that there was goodness all around them. And God sent incredible men of God and prophets to them and worked with that nation and gave them opportunity after opportunity. But they were very caught up in idolatry. They were caught up in, in their, own, their own thing. So here we find an interesting situation because Judah has a good king and uh, Israel is still reeling under the leadership of Ahab and Jezebel. And now Joram is on the throne and 
The Bible says in 2 Kings 3, verse 1, Now Joram was the son of Ahab, he began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. He wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father uh, uh, and like his mother. <clears throat> For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master. Rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs, a hundred thousand rams, and the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. He went and sent unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people thy people, my horses, as thy horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, the king of Judah, and seven, excuse me, the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the king, hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel went, uh, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, went down to him. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. But now bring me a minstrel, bring me a psalmist, or a harpist, rather, and it came to pass when the harpist played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle, your beasts, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. You shall smite every fenced city, every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all the wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. When the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone on the water and the boy bites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country. And they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. They, all stopped, they stopped all the wells of water, felled the good trees, only in Kirharaseth left they stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. This is such an interesting story, and I apologize for the lengthy reading, but I want you to understand the setting as we begin to discuss I 
I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has a way of directing our steps. God also is very mindful, I believe, of the steps of a wicked king who happens to be going along with a good king. And God in his mercy, amen, uh, there is, there's an overflow of blessing. There's an overflow of kindness that reaches somebody that otherwise would have been rejected. Let me just say as we start looking into this setting, it, it really does matter who you spend your time with. It really does matter who you run with. And it really does matter, amen, that you get around the right people. Obviously, you're in the house of God today. There's something in your heart that wants God or you've got a very nagging wife. Amen. Something, something's going on. Amen. Let me, let me just encourage you. Hang, hang tough. Amen. Stay around the people of God. We'll do you good. Amen. You'll benefit by hanging around the right people. You'll benefit by coming to church. Amen. You will benefit uh, by the right friendships. Now, having said that, let's just talk a little bit about the setting that we're looking at. We've got the divided kingdom. We, we, we've got Joram, who is king, who has got such a horrible heritage of Baal, Baal worship, and such rebellion against God. We know the story of Elijah, Elisha's predecessor, and how his desire was to turn Israel back to the one true God. And, and how it, 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 in some ways it almost took place. But yet there was such a, a yearning for idolatry in the northern kingdom. Uh, that that this, this kingdom was just far from God. It, somebody made a statement a long time ago. As the leaders go, so go the people. Um, and, and we've seen that played out many, many times. Uh, there's just something about it. It's the truth. And uh, I, I would, would to God that we had godly leaders in America. I promise you that a lot of things would change all the way down if we had some God-fearing leaders in this land. Amen. There's just something about leadership that's living like they ought to that influences the rest of the crowd. And we may not have it in the land nationally, but I want you to understand every one of us, in a sense, is a leader, and we have our scope of influence. And we do have the ability to live right, to have faith in God, to demonstrate to other people what it means to have morality, amen, to have a fear of God. And we can make a difference, maybe not nationally, but I want you to understand for those that know you, you can be the difference and make a difference in this hour. Amen. So we have basically Joram, who's a man of partial obedience, a man who had terrible parents. I don't think we disagree with that. And Baal was commonplace. So this is where he's coming from. And he's getting together with the king of Judah. And so as Basically, what takes place is as these two kings get their armies together and begin to march, they take a very interesting path to get to Moab. And that is around the bottom of the Dead Sea, through the country of Edom. And as they're traveling through Edom, and this is, this is very, very interesting, especially considering the history of Israel as they came into the Promised Land. But Edom receives them, allows them through, and not only that, but they join up with them. And the king of Edom comes along to go against Moab. So all of these three kings are marching into a valley, into a, what appears to be a dried-up riverbed. And this is sometime around August or September, so the, the average temperatures are about 105 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the valley of Sin, or Zin. This is the valley that's got history. It's a valley of failure. This is the valley where, where Israel, as they come in 
toward the promised land, send out 12 spies. And this is where 12 spies come back with an evil report. This is the place where, where basically they, they began the spy journey through the wilderness, the bottom, through the wilderness of, of sin, and, and their entire future is changed. And 40 years are added to their wandering. This is also the place where Moses is so put out with the people of Israel that rather than speak to the rock, he strikes the rock and he loses his ability to go into the promised land. So this is a place of failure. It's a, pla- it's a desert. It's a valley. It's hot. It's dry. And there's seven days into it. And all of a sudden they realize we are out of water and we're going to die. The response of the king of Israel is interesting. It's kind of like, we're all going to die. That's his response. It's hopelessness. It is utter hopelessness. God surely brought us out here to die. What's interesting is we don't find anywhere where King Joram sought God about this in the first place. We don't find any, any any discussion with a man of God in his life, he, with a prophet, there's, there's nothing. He just sees that Moab has rebelled and he's out and he's ready to get revenge and bring somebody else with him. Can I just mention to us today, not every battle that we find ourselves in is the devil's fault. And not every battle and every valley that we find ourselves in is God's fault. There's a lot of times, ladies and gentlemen, where we flat messed up. Now, we may blame it, but I'm telling you, we make our messes. Anybody here good at making messes? I mean, we know how to do it. This is just kind of a human thing. And... God saw this whole thing taking place before they ever stepped the first step on their march. Amen. And I want you to understand, (laughs) God's able to turn anything to good. I don't care if it's your rebellion. If you're here today and you've lived a life of rebellion and you're smarting over your decisions, I want you to understand God can still take that as negative as it is and turn it to good. Amen. Nothing's too hard for him. He's able. He's able today to change your life. You can walk out of this place in victory. Amen. So number one, amen. Let, Let me just... Can I give you a, a, a verse out of the Old Testament? Trust in him at all times. Can I just give you those words? Trust in him at all times. You're going to make decisions. It'd be good for you to seek the Lord. It would be good for you to talk to a man of God in your life. Amen. Let's just, just chalk that down. Trust in the Lord. Amen. At all times. I understand that's Hebrew for don't be stupid. Amen. Number one is the valley. The valley. These are just seven quick observations from Carl Brown. Typically, we read about valleys and we think about going through trials. A trial basically is a time where we don't see God, we don't feel God, we don't know what God's doing. Um, Be honest with me. Has anybody been in a trial? All right. For those of you who have not, uh, God delivers from lying. And if that's not the case, hang on, you're going to find one. You may walk into it soon. But that's when you don't know what's going on. And how God uses valleys. Amen. He uses times where we have no idea what's going on. God's able to turn off the water. He's able to turn off the water and turn up our thirst. Amen. And stir us up and get us to a place where we're ready to listen and ready to respond. Amen. Some of you have been in that place. Some of you are witnesses 
of the fact that God's able to take you to a certain spot, shut off the water, and stir up your thirst for him. Oh, I'm so glad God's still doing that today. Amen. Lord, whatever it takes, make us thirsty. Amen. For you. So he knows what it's going to take to get us to cry out to him. And, and, and what we do when we're in this point of walking into a dry place, into a valley, how we handle it is so important. It is so important. Um, I was thinking about the verse out of Psalm 86. It talks about people coming to Jerusalem, but on the way, on the way they're passing through a valley of Baca and they make it a well. The valley of tears. In Spanish, it's not the valley of Baca, it's the valley of lagrimas, the valley of tears. It's a valley of weeping. Amen. Sometimes that's where we find ourselves and we don't understand why life is is dishing this out to us. And all we can do is cry while we wait and do our best to trust God. Amen. But I want you to understand that valley is pretty important, not just for you and your development, but somebody's coming along behind you and somebody's watching your attitude and your spirit as you're in your valley, as you're in the midst of a situation you don't understand why it's happening. Amen. Life seems unfair. Somebody's watching. Somebody's coming behind. Isn't it good to be able to drink at the well of somebody who never gave up the faith? Amen. Sometimes we have funerals of people who refuse to give up the faith. And to their last breath, amen, they were trusting God. I drink from those wells. I get strength from those wells. Amen. Thank God for the righteous that have gone on before us and refused to give in. Amen. And those that are still among us that have gone through valleys, I'm telling you, that means something to hear from somebody who's been through something. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. It's one thing for you to pat your brother on the back and say, I know you're going through a valley. Cheer up. I'm praying for you. It's another thing for somebody to pat you on the back and say, I've been through that same valley. And let me tell you how God delivered us. Let me tell you what God can do. Hallelujah. That's when you're drinking out of the well, amen, where somebody else has passed through. Praise God. So some people never learn the art of ditch digging, the art of being able to create pools, amen, where the rain can fall. Some people just go in kicking and screaming and come out the same. Amen. I know by personal experience in my clinical studies of people who have gone into trials kicking and screaming. (laughs) That's right. I know them pretty well. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not in control. God's in control. He is in control. And it just, the best thing we can do is get a hold of his hand and not let go. I think of, of, the, uh, of, of King Saul and his incredible opportunity to trust God. He was handed golden opportunities to be able to get to know God. Saul had the perfect scenario to be able to trust God. God even sent him wonderful help. How, how can it get any better than having a David at your side to protect you? And to bless you and help you. And, 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 and everything that is an opportunity to him. Because he has no relationship with God. Amen. He blows it on every side. Can you see him there waiting for Samuel and the sacrifice? And supposedly the people are not with him. They're, 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 they're threatening to leave and and rebel, and and it's just going from bad to worse in his mind. What a perfect opportunity to stop everybody and say, you know what, we're going to wait for the man of God, and we're going to pray, and we're going to trust God, and the God who's always kept us, the God who brought us into this promised land, is going to keep us. Amen. Lord knows we need voices of leadership today. Somebody who's able to stand up and say, we may not understand what's going on. We may not understand where we're headed all 
together as a nation, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing we know, God's never left us yet. Amen. He's always protected his people. Amen. And God's going to keep on protecting us. And God's going to make a way. Let's just hang tight until we hear a word from the Lord. Praise God. He had the opportunity, but his knee-jerk reaction robs him of the blessing that he could have garnered, amen, just by digging a ditch and waiting, by creating an opportunity for God. These three kings in our story crossed the wilderness of Edom, amen, place of shifting sands, place of failures, seven days into the wilderness. Uh, Pretty amazing to me that after seven days, now they wake up and say, you know what, we probably need to ask a man of God about this situation. Don't you just hate it when people say, I told you so. I just can't imagine what I would have felt if I'd have been on the ship with the Apostle Paul. After all of the storm and all of the loss, and, and they're about ready to lose the ship, and he said, sirs, You should have listened to me. (laughs) I told you so. There's there's a lot of problems we get ourselves into if we just if we just would have made one phone call and said, Pastor, what do you think about this? Or brother elder in my life, what do you think about this? Or godly saint who, who knows how to get a hold of God. What do you think about this? Amen. I'm telling you, church, you weren't designed to live this life successfully alone. We need each other. And Lord knows we need a word from God. Amen. We need to have an ear open to the voice of the man of God that God has put in our lives. Amen. Lord, help us as a church. Amen. Be hungry for the word of God. Be open. Be ready. When your pastor preaches to you, be ready to listen. Be ready to receive it. I cannot tell you how much I thank God. We thank God as a family, my wife and I, many, many times. Thank you for the man of God that you put in our lives. Thank you. Amen. For the day that you brought us into this fellowship. Praise God. And, and, and there have been many times where I've heard a word of direction. And nobody else knew. Amen. But it was a word from God for me. Praise the Lord. And God's still doing it. And he will continue to do that. Yeah, probably seven days. No, you probably should have asked God before you ever got into the mess. Before you ever left. Take advantage of the counsel of a man of God. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not... Help me. In the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, To me, that sets the stage for the entire psalm. Okay? This is the man who's blessed. Right? The very first order of business is who he allows to influence him and who he does not allow to influence him. You want to be successful? Control your ears. Control your hearing. Pay attention to what you're listening to. Cut off some voices. Amen. You need to get away from some voices that are speaking negativity into your mind and unbelief into your mind, into your ear. Just cut it off. Amen. Be like the man in Psalm 1 that says, I'm not going to listen to that kind of counsel. Praise God. Oh, Jesus, touch our minds, touch our hearts, and above all, touch our ears and help us to receive into our hearing. Amen. Things that are going to be for our good. He refuses to sit in the seat of the scornful. He refuses, amen, to sit with sinners, walk with them. But more than anything, it's that counsel thing. It's that listening to opinions thing. Amen. So, if you're careful about what voice you listen to, you'll probably keep yourself away from unnecessary trips through the wilderness. Amen. So, God in his mercy provides something close by. It's a man of God. And he's got a word for them after a, a, a short little process. Isn't it interesting? I, to me, I find this so 
interesting that God, it's like God places that man within their reach. I don't know what it means to you to be able to call on a man of God in time of trouble. I hope you revere our pastor. I hope there's something in your heart where you revere him, and it's not just the man who preaches on Sundays and Wednesdays, but it's the man that I want speaking into my life. You know, God has, in his kindness, he'll, he'll, he'll put you even when you're walking where you shouldn't walk. Amen. There's a man of God not too far from you. Fact is, today, he's just a phone call away. Amen. God, God has put in our proximity the influence that we need. Amen. To be able to make right choices and right decisions. Thank God for the man of God. I, I, I still marvel when I look back. Now, I'm over 60 years old, ladies and gentlemen. I look back at my life, and I, I can, now I can begin to tally I could begin to write down the influences of men in my life who spoke into my life, men who helped shape my life, men who challenged me to think differently. God put them there. That was the mercies of God that, that had good influences. I can also look back and I can see when I was in Peru, I was just... I, I was in Iquitos in the jungle. There were, there were two times where I was very close to death when I was a young man there, and I was able to be in those two different areas. One was in the Amazon, and one was in a traffic situation where I was thrown from the back of a pickup. And in both of those both of those situations, 15 years old, I did not even realize the depth of the mercies of God on my life. But now I look back, amen, now I cross through those areas where, where it just could be, it's just the mercies of God that I'm breathing, living, alive today to be able to share with you today. It's the goodness of God, and I know I'm not the only one here today, that God has shown mercy to you, and if it wasn't for his kindness, amen, you wouldn't be here, amen, you would not be, and, and it's that way that I look back on my life and I see men who, who have spoken things to me. And it's had everything to do with, with my future, which is now my present. I, I remember Carl Ballestero, my precious uncle, the man I was named after. And uh, so good to see Carlene and Nyla. Amen. My cousins. I, I was blessed to be able to spend an entire day with him and just take him to his old haunts in Portland, Oregon. And we hit bookstore after bookstore, Powell's Books and all kinds of other bookstores. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't trade that day for anything. And there were other times where that man spoke things into my life that marked me, had a, a distinct impact on me. We were just in Peru. Robert Nix is 82 years old, a tremendous man of God. That man embedded some things deep in my soul. I, I, it's just the goodness of God that brought our family down there to be with them for that time as I was a young man and, 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 and being formed in many ways. And there were just things that they put in my spirit. Amen. My own father. Amen. And then later on, a, a men, like, men like our bishop, not here, but in Oregon, amen, where he made a mark and an impact on my life just after we got married, put things, wrote things in my heart I'll never forget. 
Uh, this is just, it's hard to explain, but folks, I want you to understand, if you've got a man of God in your life, and, and, and you're, you're listening, and you're, you're receiving what he's got for you, amen, it can mark you for your future. It can change your eternity, amen. Don't be resistant to the voice of a man of God, amen. When it, when it comes across as something that you didn't want to hear, amen, check your spirit and receive what the Lord might have for you. It may be that God is trying to influence your future and, and, and keep you out of some areas that, that you need to stay away from and on and on. Thank God for a man of God. So we, we don't find even, this is what's very interesting, we don't even find Jehoshaphat praying before going into this experience with an unholy yoke, if you please, an unequal yoke. I don't care how long you've been living for God. Sometimes, folks, we just are not paying attention. Amen. So they don't. Here's another lesson. Amen. Elijah would not have given Jehoram the time of day if it wouldn't have been for Jehoshaphat. And we can talk a lot about who you're running with. And if you're rebellious here today, and if you're just doing everything wrong and you're bent on going the wrong direction... Let me give you a word of advice. Don't cut your ties with good people. Don't cut ties with people that fear God, people that are pray for you. Amen. You just never know what God can do and how things can change and how your mind and your heart can change. Amen. So anyhow, he says, Elisha says, bring me a minstrel. We know the story. There's just something powerful about worship, and I... I've, I've been around it. I've played the organ for many years uh, until I forgot how. But I, I, I know something about music and worship. And folks, can I just tell you today, we, we're not just going through some kind of a ritual and routine when we sing our songs. When we sing before worship, or before the preaching, I mean, when we, when we have our time of worship, there's, there's a reason, there's a method to the madness here. We're getting our hearts in tune. We used to sing old songs like, let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. We used to sing songs that had to do with preparing our spirit, our heart. Amen. A lot of those songs have gone by the wayside. And we're singing new songs with new lyrics. And I'm not here to poke fun at new songs and new lyrics. But in, in the midst of all of the new set, I hope that we, that we don't lose songs. I hope somebody's still writing songs Amen. That have to do with our desperate need for God. Our desperate need for his presence to move. Our desperate need for him to work and prepare us. Amen. I was in a church a long time ago. I was a teenager. Just come home for Bible school. And the pastor told me, he said, I want you to understand something. He said, when I, when I talk to my worship leaders, I tell them, I tell them, do not give me the pulpit if we haven't touched God yet. I'd rather sing all night and worship all night, however long it takes, I don't want to preach to people who are not in tune. And I've thought about that, that it impacted, it really impacted me. I thought, wow, the power, the power of a prepared heart when it comes to the preaching of the word. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take advantage of the times where a man or woman gets up and begins to sing and lead us in worship, lead us into the presence of God. That's not just some kind of ritual, and it's not just some kind of a, a, a Pentecostal sport, okay, or entertainment. You know what it really is? It's preparing us for what we need to hear. It's preparing us, amen, to, to be ready to, to listen to the voice of God, to receive what God has has for us. And I don't know if it's for Elisha's benefit solely or if it's also for the benefit of a couple of impatient kings of Edom and Israel. 
But he puts everything in slow mode. Start playing. Just start playing. And when his own spirit has settled down, maybe Elisha's all worked up because he's looking at King Joram, who's still walking in the ways of Jeroboam. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he had to settle his own spirit down. All I know is there's something about worship music. (laughs) Go ahead and listen to Led Zeppelin in your car and tell me how you drive and tell me how it all goes and then compare that with listening to worship music. Tell me how your spirit is. <laughs> Folks, I, I'm, I promise you, I don't listen to Led Zeppelin, but I, I promise you, there's something in the spirit relative to the music we listen to. Amen. And when we worship, when we listen to worshipful music, amen, it just puts us in tune. There's been times I've just wept in the car while driving, listening to music. Listening to worshipful music. Amen. There's just, there's some, sometimes in church, there's just something I feel because of the music. The, music's not evil. Amen. If it's worshipful, it's a beautiful thing. And, and, and now we have Elisha in tune with God, and he has a word for them, and he gives them a specific word. So, anyhow, moving quickly along, he may, he may have been doing this for Elisha, but there's two kings that really need to feel it and to hear it. Number three is the promise in the valley that I see here. I told you about my wife's situation I, recently, the cancer, the, the treatment, all the stuff that's happened with her. But what's beautiful, what's beautiful is, is in the midst of a valley, in the midst of despair, in the midst of a death sentence, if you please, when God gives a promise. Has anybody ever, be, be honest with me, has anybody ever received a promise from the Lord and you've held on to that promise? You, you know what I'm talking about. And we were talking about this just yesterday. Um, she, she, after she found out that she had cancer, she, she was praying and she she told the Lord specifically, she said, I, I don't care what you do with my life. My life is yours. I am resigned to whatever you want to do with me. If you want me to live, I'm happy. If you want to take me, I'm happy. And it was, that, it was at that moment that the Lord spoke to my wife. And he said, This is going to be a journey of blessing. And so she, that's when she went out and got the notebook and began to write down every blessing. And, 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 and what I'm, what I'm seeing live out, being lived out in front of my eyes in my own home is, is exactly how we need to respond in our trials. Rather than the yo me response rather than looking at our situation and focusing on the negative it's the blessing it's been she's written one after the other down if you open up her notebook you're going to see things like like i did not have the complications that i could have had with regarding neuropathy I never, she'll write, she wrote, I, I never was sick one time because of the chemotherapy. It's, it's blessing after blessing. You'll find in her notes the, the time that I was able to talk to a backslider because of an appointment that I had for my cancer treatment. And I was able to talk to her about getting back to God. That never would have happened if I had not been in this situation. 
And she began to just write while she filled up the entire notebook, and she started on a second one. Every day it was highlighting, highlighting. And then the family, the friends, the support. And then that was the promise of God, and God fulfilled that promise. It's been, it's been an incredible blessing. And then I told you about how she ended up in the hospital because of, of the chemo pill and, and some other things. And just her, her heart was racing out of control. They, there was just things were happening. And finally she was in the room, and her throat started closing up on her. And that was it. There were doctors, nurses everywhere. Everything was happening. And in one moment, there was a certain moment where everybody was out of the room. She closed her eyes. She relaxes back and just breathes deep. And all of a sudden, she feels Bishop's hand upon her arm. And she opens her eyes to see Bishop, and nobody was there. And that's when the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm here. Now... I don't know what that means to you, but in, ladies and gentlemen, we can be in the middle of a desert seven days in and no water, but all we need to know is, is I'm here. I'm with you. And you know that everything's going to be fine. Amen. Get a hold of his hand today if you've not been holding tight to it. Amen. I want you to understand. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. He's given us promises. He's given us beautiful promises. Amen. And, and basically, the promise is water. The kings didn't have to provide it. They just had to prepare for it. This is it's like the gift of the Holy Ghost. Nobody can fill other people with the Holy Ghost. Okay? We, we can't do that. But we can prepare ourselves for it. We can prepare ourselves for that living water, amen, that's going to come. We don't know how it comes. We don't know all of the intricacies of the, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We still don't, we don't see it, amen. It's like the wind. We can hear it. We can't see it. But God's able to feel where preparations have been made. Can I, can I just say to somebody today, if you need the Holy Ghost... Amen. It's time to dig some ditches. Just make room for where the water can flow. Make room for where the water can pool up. Make room for where God... If you'll just repent of your sin, and you'll carve out and remove, amen, the space that you had dedicated to evil things, to things that didn't please God, Amen. Get your repentance down. You know what you're doing? You're digging a ditch and you're making room for the water to come and to fill that ditch. You're making room, amen, for the presence of God to come. Number four, the instruction. Make this valley full of ditches. This is an act of faith. Amen. I don't know how, but I do know the one who promised it. The carnal mind, the carnal mind says, dig ditches? <laughs> no, we need to conserve energy. We're seven days into the wilderness. We're on the brink of dehydration. Amen. Blessed bless is the man who can simply obey the word of God. Just, just obey it. Just, just do it. Amen. And literally, this is what repentance is all about. It's making room for God to move in. So I, can I just say this? And I'll give you my heart. And it's my only chance anyway. Okay? So... Uh, we're so quick sometimes to get people's hands up in the air in the altar because we want them to get the Holy Ghost so bad. But I've watched repentance as being cut short. God help us as altar workers to be sensitive. And if somebody's repenting, let's let them repent. There's some things they need to be carving out of their life and get, getting rid of. Let's encourage them. We can pray repentance with them. Amen. And help them through the process. And then it's going to be time, amen, to lift up their hands and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But there's nothing like a, a beautiful experience in repentance. Amen. 
the word for three thirsty kings, dig a ditch. It's the command from God. Amen. It's like, kind of like, stretch forth your hand. You want a miracle? <laughs> stretch forth your hand. Take up your bed and walk. Go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. You know, God wants you involved in this miracle business. God's going to do what he's going to do, but you've got to do what you've got to do. Amen. And we want to respond, amen, to the leading of the Lord. We don't have time to go into it anymore. The level of difficulty is number five. I love this verse. This is an easy task for the Lord in the net version. He will also hand Moab over to you. This is really important, and I'm, I'm rushing here to the end. Musicians, whenever they're ready, can kind of come this way. This is an easy task for the Lord. In other words, if I can do this, then I know I can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, if he can fill pools with water, he can give you Moab. Amen. He can give you victory in your battle. Okay? We have to understand this is not hard stuff for God. If you're finding yourself in in a valley today and in struggle and in dryness, I want you to understand it's not difficult for God. He can turn it all around in a heartbeat, in a moment. Everybody say the miracle. This is what I want to try to get across to you. Number six is the why. Okay? The miracle of the water in the ditches. I'm telling you, church, when we see miracles, we are so excited we can't stand it. We feel like this is what it's all about. I remember the miracle of a woman in in Oregon who, who literally crawled to a wheelchair to get into the wheelchair to get into the service and could not lift her hands. She was in terrible shape. And I remember, amen, it was that night. She was really, they were expecting death. The doctor had pretty much written her off. And in one moment of time in the altar service, that woman was struck by the power of God, jumped out of her wheelchair, and began to push it all the way around the building. Folks, I've seen some incredible miracles. I've seen the dead raised to life in Lima, Peru. I will never forget what I saw. When we see miracles, somehow there's something in us. It's it's like, this is it. This is what we live for. This is it. This is the zenith of living for God is when we see powerful miracles of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the book of Acts Church. No, the miracle... Amen, is the means. It's not the end. And the power of God that's able to fill up holes, amen, that you've dug out with water, that's not the end. That's the means. You need to drink up. You need to get strength, amen, for the journey. You need to get what you need. But the means is the battle that, is, that also is the battle that's in front of you. And the end is your victory. Amen. Folks, what I'm trying to say is he's giving these guys who don't really deserve it a drink of water. Amen. For them, for their cattle. Amen. For whatever they've got with them, for all of their soldiers. And, and, and they're able to drink up and renew strength. Because there's a battle to fight and God wants the enemy annihilated. Here's my point. Number seven. It's partial victory. And this is, I I hope someone will receive this today. The miracle is not the end. The miracle is to give you strength for the journey, to build up your faith. The end is to go into the battle. So they do. They begin to wipe out cities. They begin to fulfill the will of God. And finally, they're down to the one last place. And, and the king of Moab is inside. And, and of all the grotesque things, this is one of the most crazy things in Scripture. This king gets up on the wall, takes his son, who's supposed to be king after him, lays him out on an altar, kills him, burns him as a sacrifice in front of of the people in the town and the people outside the wall that are trying to get in to kill him. 
And Israel doesn't have the stomach for what they're seeing. The Bible says there was great wrath against Israel. They were disgusted at Israel. And Israel was sick to their stomach. And they turn around and they walk away. And they head back home with a partial victory. If God has delivered you from drugs, from alcohol, if he's been kind to you in your wilderness, but you're still opening up the door for something that you know does not please him, that's a partial victory. God didn't fill up water pools to give you strength. He didn't pour his presence upon you. Amen. Can I say it this way? Ladies and gentlemen, the gift of the Holy Ghost is not the end. It's the means. We don't just live to speak in tongues and then die. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. God's got a a battle for you to fight. There's a war that you're going to be involved in. He's given you strength. That's what the Holy Ghost is all about. Amen. We come, we rejoice. God pours out his spirit. The water flows. Amen. The pools are filled. This is not the end. This is to get us ready for what God wants us to do. Amen. I wonder if there's anybody that during this time of worship would be able to dig a well, to dig a hole, to dig a place that God's able to fill with his presence. Amen. And I want you to keep in mind this, this, whatever God does for you today, it's strength for the journey. Amen. Because there's a battle to fight. When we leave this place, there's a battle. We're gonna, we've got to fight it to the end. Don't settle for partial victory. Amen. Let's give God everything we've got. Why don't we stand and give the Lord a hand clap of praise.